Great. Hi, everybody. Great to see you all. Glad you could make it in this Friday, wherever you are in the world. I'm in the UK at the moment, so it's evening time for me, but I think for most of you, it's probably around lunch. Nice to see you all. We'll be starting soon with Lubna. She's on the call here. She's just taking a quick phone call with one of our partners um, who she's meeting up with afterwards. But in the meantime, I figured I could get some house cleaning out of the way um, and share with you a few things that you make sure that they're on your, your radar, um, that you've gotten my emails and everything with that. Um, if you haven't seen it as yet, I would have sent out an email as it relates to communication. And so there would be an email where you would be able to add our um, calendar to your Gmail calendar or to your Outlook calendar. And then that would have all of our recent events on it. Um, so you can have it all in one place um, by adding that calendar to your calendar. And that will have like the login details and everything. Um, I'll keep adding some events there that you might be interested in and checking out. Um, but if you're you're curious and, and you don't want to add things that way, you could also just have um, um, our um, our shared calendar in um, in our Excel sheet. And so the Excel sheet that I just put into the um, into the chat is um, where I'm keeping all of the links and things as well. So this this is where you'll have um, yeah every everything in one place. Hold on, let me make sure I send it to the chat here. People keep jumping into the waiting room and for some reason, Zoom is having me text them, but that doesn't that doesn't really help if they're getting it and not you all. So um, I think we should be all, all right, there we go. It's messaging to the right place now. So the link that I just sent is our Google Sheet that will have all of the upcoming information and such. Um, and so you can use that to check in on, on where we are with upcoming materials and conferences, events, things like this. Um, there's some really excited things coming up. Um, I'm confirming the time with Boston Impact Investing for our next big workshop. That will be two hours long and it's on their integrated capital game. I'm really excited for that because that gives you a chance to sort of role play in the role as an impact investor using a card game that they've developed, um, piecing together the different tools and like, um, instruments, ways to fund a project. Um, so that will be a very, very, very fun workshop. Um, we'll probably be in the afternoon on the February 7th, but that would be the next big thing that we have um, other than like this really cool workshop from the Climate Lending Network. Um, I'm going to put the description in the chat. That is on um, J January 30th. But that's something that is optional if you'd like to go and check that out. There's no, no requirement to do it. They just are a really cool network. They recently published a report on how to have um, climate justice conversations in like an, a bank in a bank setting or or with an asset manager. Um, so that might be a really cool report to go and learn more about um, and plus get hooked up with their network. And they they invited the fellows to come and join if you would be interested in participating in it. Um, you should also have seen a really good email from me on Impact Entrepreneur, our resource and magazine um, that we've given you all access to. If you haven't gotten access to Impact Entrepreneur yet, please let me know. Um, you should have seen that email from them with your login details. Um, and Impact Entrepreneur is a great website because they have all of these webinars that you can participate in. They had one earlier this week on the supply chain and how to integrate sustainability into that. Um, they'll have a bunch of other really great webinars over the next year and your membership lasts for a full year. So you'll get to check out all of those plus the hundreds of articles that come out. Um, and on that note, I would really love for you to go through Impact Entrepreneur's website and find a few Web um, articles that you really like. So on topics that you're interested in for your career or speakers you would want to get in touch with because Lori Lane Zucker, the founder of Impact Entrepreneur has promised us that he will set up some deep dives with the topics that we're most interested in. And so if you haven't seen my email, like message me in the chat and let me know so I can make sure that you have that um, Excel sheets where you can write down what are the topics that you're interested in 
and then we'll vote on what are the the main ones that we would like to invite to participate in. So we would have the opportunity for maybe two or three deep dives over the course of the fellowship program. And the sooner we get that list to Lori, the sooner we'll be able to start setting up that first deep dive. Um, and the plan is to have one in April and one in May, if not one in, in March as well. So um, the sooner we get on that, the sooner. And then the second great opportunity from Impact Entrepreneur, I love that there's so much from them, is on the Earthshot Prize. And Lori sent over um, the applications for 2023 and also for 2024. And there's an opportunity if you're interested in meeting some of those impact entrepreneurs that you would be able to um, interview and do a profile, a write-up on one of those applications to the Earthshot Prize. And so there were two finalists for the 2023 Earthshot Prize that Lori and Impact Entrepreneur suggested. So you could meet with them if you're really interested in meeting the finalists, but they have a ton of other really great um, applications that, that didn't make it to the very end. And those are solutions from all walks of, of, of the sustainability space. So it kind of depends on what you're interested in, um, in diving deeper into, whether it's on like a climate finance group or if it's on like the blue economy and what solutions are there. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a resource that you would be able to check out. So um, yeah, one second, Leah, let me just make sure that I have covered out that. So the calendar, Impact Entrepreneur, um, you're, you're, yeah, that's it. Okay. Leah, questions? Yeah. So just on that, um, the Earthshot Prize, so the profile, if we wrote one up, the idea is then it would be published on Impact Entrepreneur. Is that the? Yeah. They're, okay. Yeah. Lori's excited to do that. Um, okay. We would need to work with them a bit to um, like get it up to a publishable standard. So that's why I want to know if you're if you're interested in joining um, to to let me know. And um, yeah, which, whichever one of those applications that you're interested in, and then we'll go to the next step of getting you in touch with them, writing a profile or interviewing them. Um, yeah. If you don't end up writing something, that's fine. I think it's more so to just meet these people who are the entrepreneurs in the space and, and get a chance to ask them questions, learn a little bit about their business. Um, the application, you'll see that it has a lot of information on on the solutions that they're putting in place so it's uh, interesting i'm going to go through a few myself cool maria that would be great yeah take a look at the the google folder and see see which of those applications you'd be interested in learning about okay any more questions from anybody yeah and for those who just joined um i'm going to share the recording afterwards so you can make sure to watch what um what i just shared about our calendar of events upcoming and our access to impact entrepreneur. Cool. Okay, if there aren't any more questions, um, let's invite Lubna um, so you can get to meet her. Um, Lubna Marie Elia is our founder. Um, she's the head of our board. She's amazing. I'm really happy to have been a fellow and worked with her in the past and now get to work with her directly as program coordinator of the fellowship program. But um, yeah, Lubna, I would love for you to introduce yourself and and then we could get a chance to meet some of the fellows and yeah, sort of talk about the impact investing space and what your journey has been in it. So yeah, how are you doing today? Oh, we're not hearing you. Now can you hear me? <laughs> On mute all the time. Well, I am so thrilled to see so many people on this call, um, some names and faces I know and many new ones. So welcome to the New England Impact Investing and Oikos um, Fellowship. I, I really wanna give kudos to Stephen because this uh, program has taken a whole new form since he has come on board. And I think he had the benefit of participating in the first two fellowship programs we held during the pandemic, the early days of the pandemic. Um, and to garner components of that to build into this fellowship and expand it substantially. And, you know, I think what's impressive is how many partnerships um, Stephen has already built with other um, 
people who are very active, other organizations that are very active in the social impact world, impact investing, sustainable investing, and how generous they have been with the resources and the opportunities they're willing to make accessible to you all. Um, so I think and hope you will find a lot of value in this program. Um, and hopefully it will pay off in spades for years to come. Uh, even with our much more scaled back initial programs, I think um, several of the fellows that participated reach benefits um, even months after the program, just from the exposure they received during the program. I will say that I recognize you are all all over the world um, in different time zones, and so I appreciate your presence on the call and the fact that some have to participate virtually. Um, I will say that to the extent you can really use these, whatever they may be, five months to dive as deep as you can, to take advantage of as many resources as possible, um, that, that is what will uh, make this a, a kind of a wholesome, positive experience for you, you know, and to the extent you can interact with your fellow fellows, that is also going to be um, a font of richness. Uh, so it is, it's an, an intense learning journey. I'm sure you all have day jobs or school or family commitments and everything else on the side. So I recognize the challenge of making time, but to the extent you can carve out some time for yourself and prioritize this over the next um, four months, I, I definitely think uh, it will pay off in space. So all that to say, uh, why did I start this? You know, what's my background? So uh, I have a 20 plus year history of nonprofits. I've always been in the nonprofit sector. And that's because I grew up for eight years of my life in Jakarta, Indonesia, and my parents are both from developing countries. And um, we were there because my dad was working for Exxon Mobil, well, Mobil Oil at the time, the petroleum company. And, uh, and he always says to me, you know, I'm the revolutionary daughter who's like making up for all his sins of the <laughs> oil executive. So that's my remit. But um, but anyway, so we were there for eight years. I think I saw an extent of poverty that I have never, had never been exposed to really. Um, and by the time I was probably 14, I remember kind of making a commitment to myself that I wanted to be in the social sector and do things that um, helped other people access opportunity, the opportunity to provide them, themselves and their families and to find a better life. So, um, so I did pursue that through humanities, through economics, um, through international relations and a variety of studies in my undergrad and graduate careers. Um, worked at different nonprofits, including Teach for America in Houston, where I started as their director of development. Um, worked for three years for the Catholic Church because I was working, I was launching a young adult retreat program in Houston and they kind of pulled me away from Teach for America to work for them full time. So I did that for three years. And then um, came to Boston because my plan was to go to grad school and I fell in love with Boston, which is a beautiful city, if any of you want to come visit or already live here. Um, and I came here to go to grad school at BU. And after grad school, I had two job offers after a long search. One was with Design That Matters, which is a design for development firm. Um, that focuses on developing tools that are repairable and accessible in developing countries to improve literacy or child health, or a bunch of different things. Um, and one was with to do compliance for a hedge fund. And they were about the same base salary, but the base salary for the, the Design That Matters job was discounted by a big portion because I had to fundraise within the first six months to earn my full salary. So I remember walking across the Harvard slash MIT bridge trying to think like, what am I going to do? And I asked myself, which of these paths will take me where I ultimately want to go, which is, you know, social impact and, and really kind of changing the world from the, you know, from the ground up. And the obvious answer there was design that matters, even though it was terrifying to accept a lower salary and have to prove my worth by uh, fundraising. But, um, but I did choose that and it was definitely the right path. So, and besides the fact that the compliance, um, the hedge fund manager who interviewed me said, uh, you know that everything that we work for on the hedge fund side kind of runs counter to your goal to do good in the world. <laughs> he said something to that effect and I was like, oh yes, yes I know, but I really knew that. <laughs> so, so I had this little, you know, uh, moral dilemma in my head. So in any case, um, that put me on a path to really being exposed to the world of social enterprise 
enterprise impact investing, although it existed since the 50s through community development finance institutions and other tools, um, it was not really a term that was coined per se until closer to 2008. Um, so that wasn't a thing at the time that I started in social enterprise, but social enterprise is very much a thing. So I got a lot of exposure through design that matters to social enterprise um, networks. And I then, um, then I, after a couple of years, I went to Root Capital, which was really my first experience in the impact investing sector. I stayed there for about um, almost 11 years in a variety of, variety of roles. I started really in fundraising and then moved to kind of internal operations. Um, and that was my exposure and my you know, entry into the world of impact investing. And Willie Foote, the CEO there, was really instrumental in working with um, Jen, like the Global Impact Investing Network and others to coin the term and start building the ecosystem for impact investing. So it was really pivotal for me to be part of those early conversations, you know, and have that exposure. Um, so all that to say, why did we launch the fellowship? So um, in, 2000, in 2016, I was trying to think what's the next step in my career. I was interested in COO type roles, um, again, in the nonprofit sector. Um, but I also was having a lot of people reach out to me to try to get into impact investing. And I didn't want to, you know, I was like, I'm not the only resource here. I can't have 20 informational interviews per day. Like, how can I connect these people with each other and other resources? So I talked to one of my mentors and he said, um, you know, you have a very strong network in impact investing and, and Boston is a great place for finance and social impact and a number of things that could create a great ecosystem for impact investing. And yet there is no kind of informal network here uh, that, that really brings together the impact investing, the individuals who are interested in supporting this. And I was amazed, I was, I was like, you know, can that be the case? And I did some research and sure enough, you know, there were all sorts of meetup groups in New York and San Francisco, but when you looked in Boston, you know, I think BASIC was around then and maybe a few other um, networks, but it was, it was much harder to find any kind of meetup group or, or you know, group that was interested in focusing on the impact investing piece. So, um, so this mentor even suggested to me, why don't you start a meetup group, call it something like New England Impact Investing Initiative, so he gave it its name. This is Tim Rowe of Cambridge Innovation Center, in case anybody is wondering. And, um, and he said, you know, and you could kind of launch this informal network. So that's what I did after thinking about it for a long time in November 2016. Um, by virtue of the steering committee that later became the board, uh, we turned it into a nonprofit and got nonprofit status in 2018. Um, and we have been functioning since as a nonprofit that is entirely volunteer led since then. So we have no paid staff. We are, you know, Stephen is a consultant, but we've had, um, a, we've had a board throughout that meets every quarter. Um, and the opportunity to really launch the fellowship in a concerted way with Stephen, you know, at the helm has been terrific for us. Because I, at the time I launched any triple I, I found that a week later I was pregnant with my first child. I ended up having two children who are now five and six, so pretty, pretty small still very demanding of attention and I didn't have the bandwidth to kind of I, I did run two fellowship programs but not to the extent and, and to the kind of heights you are seeing it now with Stephen in charge where he's really being able to dedicate some time and effort to it so um, I feel like any triple I is my third baby and it is wonderful to see this baby thriving in the hands of Stephen um, and I think we've also tried to rekindle the local community uh, it is extraordinarily hard to get people out post pandemic, I have to say, but we had a good in person gathering when Stephen was in Boston uh, at the end of last year. So, um, so that's my intro, a little long winded, but just to give you a picture of how this came to be. Amazing. Thank you, Lubna. Um, I would, I would say that it's not just like we, we, we wouldn't have been able to do this without your support, definitely. And Lubna has been an amazing sounding board, a, definitely a big supporter of all of the decisions made to make this fellowship happen. Um, and then her and the board members who you'll get to meet as well. 
are really like allies when it comes to this. And I think they're great people to know. So that's why I was really excited that Lubina would come in and chat with us. Um, so you'll get to meet Eric and Terry and Adwa as well. Um, and they have a lot of experience that they'll bring and share and their network I think is, is really great. So there's some cool things happening because of where, where this has come from. I can remember uh, participating in some of the meetup groups before COVID happening and then joining the fellowship program that went on during the pandemic as a way to network, connect with people. And that's what we're continuing here as a, as a tool to really connect across the globe, um, not just in the New England system. And I think I would be curious, and then we should let some of the fellows ask you some questions about your own career path and maybe some advice as they're going in, into their career path with this. But I, I, I would love to hear more from you, Lubna, like why, why did this really start for you? Why was the fellowship so important for you to start to create? Um, and what, what are some of the goals that you have with uh, continuing to support this and, and be the founder and um, the head of the board for, for direct, directing us? Yeah, I think the fellowship um, took place, it, it started in the midst of the pandemic, so 2020, when number one, I had transitioned out of a job and was really rethinking. I, it was my first C-suite job. It was extraordinarily difficult after giving birth to my second child. Um, and I was rethinking, like, how do I really want to live my life? Is this really the type of role that I want? Like, what do I want to be doing with my day job, with my life in general? Um, and the thing that I was always passionate about was the NEIII community. And seeing as we were all holed up during the pandemic, I wanted to find a way to gather people. Um, and we had, since the beginning, been talking about a fellowship because we wanted, you know, our tagline has always been, um, at least it's not the formal tagline on the website, but it's been to democratize access to education about impact investing. And the reason that been something as a personal passion is because early on when I was forming NEIII, I read an article by the Beak Center at Georgetown University about the scarcity of learning opportunities in the impact investing space that don't cost thousands of dollars or where you need to be affiliated with wealth management or universities or you know some kind of particular program or network. Um, and so, you know, if we really are going to diversify the talent in the sector and bring people into the sector who, you know, have lived experience with different aspects of, you know, what we're striving to achieve through social impact, through environmental impact, through environmental justice, et cetera, um, then we have to bring people into the community and into the workplace who, who have a variety of experiences. So we can only do that if we really democratize the opportunities to be educated in impact investing in a way that really um, helps you become familiar with the language, the players, you know, the language about uh, impact measurement, which is like a whole bank of knowledge and can become very academic very quickly. Um, but so it is, it's a little bit, I think for me, when I was, you know, coming up at Root Capital and learning the sector, it was really useful to go to conferences like SOCAP where it's a little bit of a fire hose feeding, but you are immediately introduced to the lingo and the, the language and the approaches to back investing and the players. And you know, you, you really get a sense being immersed in that setting of what impact investing is all about and who kind of makes it happen and how they make it happen. So short of going to SOCAP in San Francisco each year, I thought, you know, what what are the alternative ways, the virtual ways that we can open up this experience to a broader community and potentially an international community? And with the first two groups of fellows, I actually didn't intend for it to become an international program because we really marketed it locally, like in New England. But um, we did have, with each cohort, about five international fellows, and they added a lot of richness to the conversation. So as long as it's virtual and we can make it work, then why not make it you know, more accessible internationally. And now that, you know, I think the beauty of Stephen being located in Europe and working with Oikos is that we really do have a broader and an international network. And there's a lot of opportunity there for us to be beyond kind of New England and really have an international reach. Does that answer the question, Stephen? Yeah, for me, it really does. Maybe for the others, you would like to hear more on that. 
Um, but I, I really do resonate so much with the mission that you talked about of providing this type of education for um, that, that, that there's not many other programs out there that you could get through this other than going to a master's level program and having that network and paying for that sort of access. And I think that this is this is an opportunity that we've been able to create also with all of your support because you have put in participation fees to make the program materials accessible to cover the cost of putting something like this together. Um, and, and, and also if we didn't have the support of the relationships that you have helped to develop over the past five, six years with any I being around, then this wouldn't be possible now of having that network and financial support from, from our partners. So I, I'm, I, I think we could spend some time going deeper into the impact investing ecosystem and like ways that people can learn and get more connected with others in this space. But maybe before we go further with that, we could ask some questions of Lumna or what are things that you're curious and yeah, feel free to introduce yourself. So, so Lumna gets to know who you are. Um, I sent her over your resume, so she would get a little bit of a sense of that. And plus, she's seen some of your applications. But um, yeah, this would be the first time that Lubna is getting to to really get to know you. Um, so that's also a great connection, I think. And um, if you if you're curious or want to share anything from your from your background that she might be able to help a little bit with. Yeah, Leo, jump on in. Thanks. Well, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to um, speak with us. I think we're all really excited to be a part of the program. And it's really interesting to kind of hear about how it all came to be. But, um, I, you know, for me, um, I've been in the sustainable investing space, more on the public equity side for about seven, eight years now. Um, I focused first at um, Calvert Research and Management, which is more of kind of a niche player. And now I'm at um, a global bank, more of kind of like the sustainable offerings are kind of one of many. And I think um, as I've kind of learned in this space, I'm kind of getting more interested in maybe doing something a little bit more on the private side in terms of um, impact investing that truly that you can prove that it's incremental and measurable, where that's just a little bit harder to do on the public side. But um I think my question for you is just being so close to the space for such a long time, how have you kind of seen things evolved and um, how would you kind of direct people as they're kind of coming into this space? What, what do you kind of see as the most impactful or emerging spaces that maybe are really worth a close look for us? Yeah, I think the way that the sector has evolved. So it's interesting because I went from Root Capital, which is an international impact investing player to the CDFI space with Blue Hub Capital, where I'm the current chief administrative officer. Um, and the CDFI sector, so community development finance institutions, is really where um, impact investing started to happen. I wouldn't say it even started there, but that's where the US government kind of created opportunities for banks to invest in local communities and really create the infrastructure to build healthy communities um, you know, around the US. And even before that, there were several um, religious investors who kind of positively screened what they wanted to invest in, right? So not just avoiding the sin uh, investments, but really looking at how could they use their corpus to support uh, investing opportunities that built up local communities. So, so impact investing has a long history, even before the term was coined in 2008. I think that in recent years, it's evolved you know, there's always a danger of the people who want to come into the space just because they know ESG is something people are looking for, you know, environmental, social, and governance standards. Um, they uh, want to get in on this game, right, and especially capitalize on any money that the federal government is willing to invest in green initiatives. Um, and so they start trading a portfolio a certain way. And, you know, nobody is kind of the ultimate uh, barometer of what impact really means. I mean, that is an ongoing debate. Um, but I think that when you are coming into the sector, it's really important to have a broad sense of what, you know, what are the different tools? And this is what um, Boston Impact Initiative can offer. What are the different financial tools you can use in the impact investing space? 
who are the players that deploy those tools most effectively? And how are they measuring impact? So are they really like taking an eye to not just the financial return, but to the impact in, you know, the, of their investment and measuring that in a way that, that is accessible to the, you know, everyday people who want to kind of see from a retail perspective, what are my investments doing? Um, you know, I can give you the example of like, maybe most of us uh, or some of us have a retirement portfolio, right? And most of the time, people kind of put the money in there. If they haven't chosen a fund, it's put into a retirement target fund. And they don't think about it until they get closer to retirement and then they start looking at it. I think nowadays people are, are very, um, the younger generations are much more savvy about what is their money doing. And so we've had a lot of people at Blue Hub say, no, I want my money to have a positive impact. And so how do I choose funds that are actually focused on that? So it's interesting because I've, mentioned that to Nationwide who manages our, our investments and to our investment managers, a different uh, company, and they have helped us select a number of funds and advertise those funds to our um, employees to say these are the more socially responsible funds. And there are a lot of the um, impact investing players that I knew in my time at Root, like Parnassus and some other, um, you know, impact investing type funds. So, I do think people are becoming more savvy, and I think the only way you can become more savvy about what truly has positive impact versus not is to really get a, a lay of the land as to what are the tools being used, who's, you know, like Trillium um, Asset Management, they are extremely uh, successful at stakeholder advocacy efforts, you know, and I think it'd be interesting to have them uh, present to you on how they've done that and their history with that. Um, so that's like a particular tool, a tool that, you know, an investor can use, um, but there, and then Boston Impact Initiative has this unique ability to really understand the risk and opportunity in the local Boston community and make some really um, significant investments. Aside from changing my 401k portfolio to be more uh, socially responsible, I have also now for the first time become a direct impact investor in Boston Impact Initiative. And one of my good friends, Betty Francisco, who I used to work with at Compass, um, is the CEO there now. So that felt really good for me, kind of coming into my own as a as an investor um, doing my first impact investment. So, so that's what I would say about you know really understanding kind of the lay of the land and what your money is doing. Nora, um, I think Maria had a question before I did. I just want to be respectful of her first, but do you want to go ahead, Maria, then I can go? Hey, Maria, we're not hearing you. Hi, I hope you can hear me now. Apologies. Uh, hi, Lumina. It's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, I'm Maria, so I'm currently based in Frankfurt and I'm working for a local stock exchange. Um, specifically in the ESG strategy responsible for uh, determination of products and services here um, in the ESG space. And I had a question for you. Um, how do you see the impact investment uh, be de uh, development in 2024 and let's say midterm, especially because at the moment in the ESG investment space, there are quite a few debates regarding, let's say, the concept of ESG and uh, did it affect anyhow the impact investing? And um, also, how would you personally advocate uh, for the proponent, proponent of the impact investment uh, in comparison with other types? Thanks a lot. Yeah, um, trying to think of which to tackle first. So, so you mean, how, how would I advocate for an impact investment versus something else? Like if I were talking to a potential investor or what, what's a specific question there? Right, so for example, in comparison to typical ESG investing, how would you advocate for impact investing instead? Yeah, thanks. I, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so, Impact investing, you know, I think, I mean, ESG, the criteria of ESG has been around for a long time. And, and even when um, Root Capital was bringing in some of its early large investments from 
overseas private investment corporation that has now changed its name and USAID and others, uh, they came with pretty robust ESG criteria. Um, they, I think the impact, the institutions that consider themselves more direct impact investors have created criteria for their investments that's much more specific to the particular types of investments. And then as an outgrowth of that, so like in the international development space, you know, root capital was very formative in developing early kind of metrics for how do we measure uh, social and environmental return for these, uh, you know, these investments we're making in farmers, uh, farmers and producers around the world. Um, other institutions did similar things, making the impact metrics very specific to the type of impact they wanted to have, which is useful because you have to uh, provide evidence of that to investors and others. But then it becomes very fragmented, right? And so everybody has their own way of measuring impact. And it's hard when some when an individual investor goes to their wealth management firm and says, I want to do impact investing, how do I get started? The firms are also usually uh, they have a, a real struggle trying to point them to investments and explain the impact because everything is measured um, so so kind of idiosyncratically. So then a good friend of mine, Mike McCrellis, who actually started at Root Capital, um, and others, you know, I think that at Root Capital, they developed the impact frontiers um, approach to measuring investment. And, and now through his organization, Mike McCrellis has expanded that to say, can we as more direct impact investors or intermediaries um, come up with a set of metrics that make sense for the work we're doing, but are also more largely applicable and communicable so that people can understand, you know, the average retail investor, for example, can start to understand by choosing these types of investments, this is the impact that I'm having. And, um, it, you know, and they can, can we develop like scorecards or things that help us to communicate this in a way that is more digestible. So I think there has been an effort lately to move the conversation in the impact space to you know, we all have such particular approaches to impact investing. So how do we start communicate our impact, communicating our impact in a way that's much more digestible to people, both the wealth management firms that are advising the investors and the investors themselves? Um, because I think the complexity of it can be very overwhelming at times. Uh, whereas ESG, as I started, you know, has been more standard criteria, you know, sub, like environmental factors, governance, you know, I remember answering that those questionnaires for OPIC and they're extensive and but they're like you could anticipate what's going to be in there because it's pretty set criteria. Um, so I think that that has been the challenge. You know, it's not that they're necessarily different things. I just think that the direct and intermediary impact investors have anchored more on their individual metrics or things that are more specific to their particular approaches. You know, and they're able to answer these extensive ESG questionnaires because they've always had an eye uh, on the impact piece. Is that helpful? Thank you. Um, I think I'm next. I can hop in. Hi, Lubna. My name is Nora. Um, I worked on the fundraising and investor relations side of a private equity firm for a few years, and I'm currently getting a sustainability-focused MBA at the University of Vermont. Um, and something I have been really thinking about when it comes to impact investing is the type of LP or investor who's actually going into that and how that would differ from this kind of more standard track finance that I'm used to. So I'm wondering, um, do you find that in this type of work, it's more foundations, high net worth individuals, um, kind of smaller things? So I'm very used to kind of working with, you know, four big pensions um, and just kind of where you find that capital is coming from and how that changes maybe how you're advocating for the change you can make. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think that the early entrants, like I said, to the sector were religious investors, you know, who were kind of positively screening their potential investments. Um, I remember a lot of Root Capital's early investors were religious institutions. Um, the other ones that came to the fore quickly were uh, uh, foundations and 
initially they came with their either the charitable dollars or their program related investments PRIs right the money that they can invest for a time period but they expect to be paid back and those PRIs count toward their 5% distributional requirement each year so they can count it along with their donations for the money they get out each year um, so that became a pot of money that a lot of um, impact investors started to take advantage of including root capital and I'm on the board of Prime Coalition, and they also um, draw on PRIs quite a bit. And then I think foundations have more recently have moved toward uh, their mission, you know, they call it mission-related investments, where they use more of their corpus, their uh, kind of endowment money, all of the money that they are usually just investing in the stock market, um, to look at a pot of that money, if not all of it, in some uh, positively extreme cases. And uh, invest that responsibly, you know, invest that with an eye toward impact, which was really a new move for a lot of foundations. I think that started probably about 10 years ago or more. Um, so, so that's been an interesting development. I do think you have, you know, individual investors who are just savvy to impact investing and want to get directly involved. I think more and more wealth managers um, or advisors are getting inquiries from their clients who want to get into this, so they're trying to get savvy on how to talk about it. Um, you know, those are the, and then there are some corporations who will also support it. Um, so it, it is, it, it's an increasingly larger segment, but I think when you get to things like pension funds, and when you look at their requirement to really guard their capital and, the, you know, guard the principal more than anything and make a return, it's harder for them to move into something that might be considered an impact investment unless they can show strong financial indicators, you know, and the impact um, evidence in a way that is like generally acceptable to investors, right? They want to be able to see things like Morningstar reports or, you know, financial reports that are more um, typical in the private sector. Um, and those don't always exist for the types of institutions we're talking about. And, and just so you know, I would love to keep track of the chat, but I'm not because I'm trying to be present. So Stephen, I am trusting you to keep track of the chat. No problem, I'm keeping track and I'd love for Shireen to go next and then I'll bring up a few questions from the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Libna, for spending time with us today and for starting this program and bringing Stephen on and hello to everyone else as well. Um, so my name is Shireen Khan, I'm here in Atlanta. It's 63 degrees today, so if you ever need to thaw out from being in Boston, it's a great place to visit. Um, so my question is, uh, my background is I have a, I'm currently a graduate student in sustainable energy and environmental management. And I did this to deepen my knowledge in the environmental space. Um, I already have social and governance experience from around the world. I have an MBA and an engineering degree. My goal is to basically like be a resource for investment companies, like a, a private equity firm to like help with their portfolio companies and like improve, um, I guess, various aspects of um, ESG. So my question for you is, um, I went to a sustainable investing conference in December to get a baseline knowledge and I'm very grateful for this fellowship. But I had a networking meeting a couple of days ago and um, I was lucky enough to talk to a senior exec and then they asked me like, they routed off all these parts of the firm and asked which one I wanted to sit in and I was at a loss. I didn't know what to say. And um, I was, I really felt bad that I kind of squandered that opportunity. It made me look like I was, you know, not prepared. Um, but I also don't know where to get that information. And I would love if you had some ideas for those of us who don't have experience in this space. Like, how can we just get a baseline? I had read their entire ESG report, so I was very familiar with that, but I don't, and the terms he was using sounded familiar, but I, didn't know how to like, I don't know how to get up to speed on how these firms work. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's, it would have been more fair for them to explain to you, like, this is essentially what these different departments or sectors do, because every, I mean, that's the other, you know, irony here, like every impact investing firm is set up a diff, bit differently. They have their forward facing folks that are focused on the financials and the impact. And they have the people in the core functions or back office, whatever you want to call it, um, that help the trains run on time, right? But every company has different departments, uh, different groups that have different approaches. I mean, if you go to Trillium and then you go to Eventide, they're set up differently. So I think if they just threw a bunch of 
department names at you. <laughs> I said, which one, you know, you pick your choice. Uh, it's not really fair with that. Like, I think a good follow-up question would be, could you give me a little more insight into what, which, you know, each, what each department focuses on? Um, it, because that's a fair question. You know, they're not all going to be, you're not going to find that every institution is set up the same way. And they, and I think they owe it to you to give you a little insight into like, what do the, what goes on in those departments so that I can get a sense. I mean, I think the other thing I would encourage you to do as a way of thinking ahead, you know, for the next time is start to explore through this program or other things, what are the types of functions you could see yourself filling at an impact investing institution? Are you a fundraiser? Are you great at um, building relationships? Are you an analyst? Are you great at looking at financials? Are you someone who loves operations and wants to make the trains run on time? You know, do you have HR skills and want to do more of like the HR piece? I mean, these institutions need all of it. And depending on the size, they may have a full range of functions. They may not, but um, it's helpful if going into interviews, you know something about what the company's, how it's structured and um, what function you could potentially serve or to like ask those questions during the interview. That help. Okay, thank you. Um, so I know Diane and Barika have their hands raised, but we have had a good diverse set of questions coming in from the chat. And Lubna, you'll have to leave in about 15 minutes or so. So um, let's try and keep our questions short. Um, and I'll let Diane and Barika come in next. But I'll bring up questions from Kai, Raymond, and Juliet, and and sort of. They're quite diverse, Lubna. So I don't know what you would want to touch on and how you could touch on them so quickly. But I think with this diverse group of people here, any help you can present um, or any notes you could share as like Global North versus Global South when it comes to impact investing and some trends there. Um, the next piece is sort of around how can impact investing be used for driving investments that are going to help us address um, climate change and how oftentimes these investments are instead going to profit making organizations and are not on like this impact side. And then also that I think a really helpful question is around greenwashing and greenwashing within the impact investing space. Um, yeah, how can how can we within this room here sort of work towards that? So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw those three at you and see what sticks in your answer. Yeah, I'll actually start with the one about um, climate investments because, so first of all, don't create a divide in your mind between profit making and impact because that divide does not need to exist. There are profitable social and environmental impact institutions or companies that are for profit or nonprofit or hybrid. So um, you will quickly find that there's a large variety of institutions with a variety of successes in how they pursue it. But um, Meanwhile, I think Amazon is ringing my doorbell. In any case, uh, so I think um, I'm on the board of Prime Coalition, as I mentioned, and what's fascinating there is that uh, the types of, in terms of climate change, it's such a massive problem, right? So it's like, where do you even start? And the portfolio, they pursue the problem in a number of ways. So they pursue it by, um, they have funds that they work with, like fund managers that they work with that invest directly in, in different in climate change companies at different stages, um, but they have a fund for kind of earlier stage and a fund for later stage that they're getting off the ground. Um, so they do some direct investing that's facilitated in part by the nonprofit that helps to evaluate potential impact, additionality, you know, metrics, et cetera. Um, so that's one thing. They also do a lot of field building, right? Building the knowledge and understanding of the field and they do capacity building with the, um, the portfolio companies. And so that's a really critical piece. And one of the things that they are doing through their latest initiative is, or their latest kind of fun, is um, helping also build the infrastructure and the ecosystem for these early climate ventures to succeed. Um, because a lot of, you know, climate solutions often have to do with deep tech, which is like a term for things that are very uh, like industrial or technological and have to go through several stages, gating stages before they become an approved kind of licensed product, right? Um, so as you can imagine, funding and patience and tolerance for those types of timelines uh, 
is scarce. So Prime Coalition and their funding partners are helping to address some of those gaps. Um, so on the climate front, I think there are, it's just a huge complex pro pro problem. And because of that, you have to approach it from many different directions. Um, global North versus, versus South, I'm not sure quite what the, so impact investing ecosystem different between, I mean, that's a huge question because Global North and Global South has, you know, hundreds of countries each. <laughs> so it's very hard to boil it down to one thing. Um, I will say that, you know, I, I think that the, a lot of Global North companies see opportunity in the Global South to bring solutions, right? Which can be a mixed bag. I think the Global North companies that are most successful in, in helping address issues in the Global South uh, are the ones that go get on the ground, get to know the people, hire locally, empower people locally to develop their own solutions, and then support the infrastructure with the resources that they have access to. You know, it's never like the swoop in and save that is ultimately successful. Um, it's the really people who build the infrastructure from the ground up. up. So um, I think it's, it, it, that's a hard question to tackle because, you know, there are just so many countries and there's not like a one size fits all answer there. But what was your last, about greenwashing? Oh. Yeah, on greenwashing. about greenwashing. And, and yeah, I mean, you, we can't, we can't ensure that greenwashing is not gonna happen. Like, you know, that's, a, that's impossible. But you can uh, help educate potential investors. You can come to understand a set of metrics that you really abide by and believe in, um, that you want to see kind of impact investments measured against. Uh, so you can do your own due diligence and help to educate others, but people are always going to greenwash to try to get access to pots of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we've been running out of time, so that's why we have to move quickly with the last questions. I hope the brevity um, isn't offending anyone and that we can uh, have more time with Lubna in the future to ask some more deeper questions related to this. I put into the chat the Prime Impact Fund that Lubna was mentioning. Um, so you could take a little bit more into their ethos on how they're using that to address climate change. Um, Barika, if you'd love to bring up your question, and I saw Diane, you wanted to speak up as well. Um, maybe we can take both of those questions quickly if you both wanted to share those, and then we can say goodbye to Lubna. Um, my question is probably a little bit more longer for an answer. Um, it's about like the where um, the economy is and raising funds um, with diverse teams. So I think it probably would take a little bit more time. So I'll just pass it on to the next person. Hopefully Lubna will be back and we can ask those questions about fund in the climate, the economic climate. Yeah. Well, well I say, I'd, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Lubna. Well, what, what was the question again? Because it is an interesting question. And so we're kind of like in a downturn when it comes to funds raising their next their next fund. Um, and it has had some correlation and impact on like diverse teams. Um, and so where do you see impact investing has also been part of that, that has been impacted by the, the economy and this downturn of raising the next fund rounds, um, not for the startups, but for the, the VC firms. Where do you see this happening for impact um, and how it's going to be uh, moving forward? Yeah, you mean the potential for funds to kind of turn around and start hiring more kind of aggressively, diverse, diversely, et cetera? Yes. Is that? Yes. Yeah, because, I mean, I. Yeah, because there's nobody's raising, nobody's being able to raise their fund and a lot of them are right. have to close their fund and they're more in the operations phase. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the challenge with any type of impact investing, right? You're first and foremost affected by the market. And so when you see a downturn in the market and the standard kind of financial firms are struggling, those struggles are gonna to extend to the impact investing sector. Interestingly, um, when, I think it was in 2009 or 2008, nine, the last, um, Wait, was it or the, anyway, I'm getting the years confused. It was it was 
the, the last big financial crisis, which was a good chunk of years ago, um, when a lot of uh, foundations with our corpus investments, meaning their endowments, et cetera, lost about 40% in the market. Um, but the ones that were highly invested in social, socially responsible investments actually saw those investments perform more strongly, including foundations. So we had a state of, of investors at root that like not a, probably a, a handful that pulled out at that time because they were freaked out by like the social impact piece when the market was in a downturn. And the ones that stuck around saw that we were actually part of the, like the healthiest part of their investment corpus, right? And we were doing the best compared to the 40% they were losing in the broader market. So it's interesting because like the market downturns do affect socially and you know, environmentally focused uh, investors, but sometimes those um, investments actually outperform what's happening in the market. And I can't give you the exact formula for that, but you know, I think that's like a selling point to encourage people to remember. You know, I, I obviously can't, uh, I can't control the hiring practices, but I think that that's, every company becomes shy to hire when they're facing financial difficulties, right? And, and the last thing you want to do is come onto a company and then six months later find out that you're out of a job. So, because it's all, it's just the case, like regardless of who you're hiring, it's like first, hi, last hired, first fired, sadly, tends to be the trend because you haven't invested as much time training them and they're not as up to speed. So you as job seekers should always be, uh, look at a company's financial health when you're signing on, like it may be a great opportunity, but uh, definitely always look at a company's financial health um, and keep it in mind because you know transitions can be hard, probably harder when you're older than when you're a bit younger, but uh, transitions can be hard. Anyway, I do want to give a chance to, for another question, but hopefully that was helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Barika. Thanks, Lubna. Um, Diane, if you had a quick question, we might be able to squeeze it in before Lubna has to go. Lubna, do you have time for one last one or do, should we close it up? Let her check, yeah. Yeah, my driver's arriving in two minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the chance. So um, I'm I'm actually based in the Philippines and I work for a not for profit organization. Um, our focus in a, is on nature based solutions, which are actually economically justified by but struggle with Im uh, immediate financial uh, viability. So currently we are just attracting philanthropic funds, providing grant funding, which which is helpful, but we know it's quite limited in scope. So this really creates a challenge in appealing to institutional investors who typically seek out mature and profitable projects. So I would like to seek um, some advice on the strategies or approaches of how we can adapt to bridge this investment gap and how can we really effectively position our projects um, as a viable investment uh, opportunities to those investors who are accustomed to quicker returns? Yeah, I think the best thing you can do is get um, familiar with some of the more modern impact investing approaches, you know, things that like impact, like Mike McCrellis's, I don't know what the new, his, his company changed names, but it's what used to be, I think, impact management project, and now it's uh, something else. Um, but he has a company that helps companies to consider how they frame their impact. And, and I think it's, it's pretty global. I mean, his, he can um, train people all over the world. Uh, and then also Catherine Griffin from Impactable X um, provides a similar service in measuring impact. I think when you come up with indicators that, you know, especially, you know, more impact investing savvy investors are used to looking for, uh, it gives them more confidence in your company because they start to see the same metrics they're seeing elsewhere for how your impact is measured. Um, and so I think I would say, yeah, that's the, the link. Uh, and if you could find Mike McCrillis's company too, Stephen, I think that could be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, that would be a starting point, you know, get to know more about how people talk about impact and impact measurement in particular and some of the modern approaches and then try to frame the impact of your company's work in those in those terms. I do have to meet my Uber driver. Thank you. So. Thanks, Lubna. Um, Lubna, we really appreciate you taking time to chat with us. Take care. It was good to see you all. I look forward to many more opportunities, hopefully, and thank you all for being part of this program. Have a good one. Take care. Thanks, Stephen. Bye, Lubna. Have a good day. See you. That was great.
Um, if you can stick around, we can continue to talk okay, to each other. Um, Lubna has to go, but we'll invite her for the next workshops that we do and also for some um, more networking and meetups. Um, so she's on the East Coast time, so it works really well for her to have a couple sessions over lunch. And so um, I know that lunch might be over for you um, and you might have to go on to a next meeting. But if you do want to stick around, um, let's give a like two minute break. Go get some water, uh, use the bathroom if you need to, and then we can come back and hang out for another 30 minutes or so if you want to stick around. Sound good? Cool. Hi, hi Stephen. It's Tracy here. Hi, Tracy. Hi, I'm so sorry I'm joining late, but I have the coffee, the um, conversations about coffee lunch tomorrow. So I was up and down, and now I'm about to head into Kingston. Okay. So no. I'm going to... And yes, and it's raining, so just to concentrate on the road, I'm just gonna hop out, but I'll catch up again the next. Yeah, week. no problem. And we recorded it, Tracy, so you can get to see it afterwards. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everyone. I'm seeing some people signing off in the chat. Thanks for being here. Hey, Stephen. I'm curious. Though, what it, are we just gonna like do some more meet and greets for yeah. half an hour? Or what What do you want to do? Yeah, we could hang out for um, meet and greet. We could also talk a little bit more about the resources that Lubna was sharing. It's kind of okay. just a co-created space afterwards if you want to stick around. Um, okay. Yeah, so no no pressure. There's there's really no pressure to stick around if you if you got stuff to go. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Thanks so much for organizing this. Yeah, no problem. Um, I am going to take two minutes so I can get up, stretch, get some water, use the bathroom. So let's come back at 6.05 in like two minutes from now.